This episode of Insight features Dr. Jack Ireland, a Scottish heliophysics researcher who has previously held a postdoc placement at St. Andrews and now works at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Centre. We managed to have a lengthy conversation with Dr. Ireland, which we're releasing in two parts. In this first episode, we discuss the heliophysics research he works on, the impact St. Andrews has had on his subsequent research, and the excitement Dr. Ireland finds in viewing solar eclipses. We also find out the most exciting projects he's worked on at NASA. Enjoy listening! You're listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Lavery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. Today on Insight, we've managed to snag an interview with Dr. Jack Ireland, a Scottish astrophysicist who did one of his postdocs at St. Andrews, and he now works at NASA. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Not at all. So, could you tell us uh, what it is that you're currently researching and what kind of led you to this point? Um, Well, I'm a a solar physicist uh, working at the um, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I work for a um, contracting company called Adnet uh, Systems Incorporated. And so my job is to uh, research the sun and try and understand how how it works. So I guess that's my uh, basic um, sort of job description. So yeah, I'm a solar physicist researching the sun. And then what, what the next question was, what led me to this point? Yeah, uh-huh. Well, um... What led me to this point? Well, I, I guess I've always been interested in, in science, you know, even from, like, you know, being a young kid. So I remember getting a, a, I remember getting a book where uh, on one page they had, like, a picture of the sun, and then you flip over the page, and uh, they had a picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin standing on the, on the lunar surface, and that was amazing. So, um, I guess, you know, like, that was, like, that image has stuck with me, but, yeah, I've already, always been interested in uh, in uh, science, so it wasn't that difficult uh, a choice for me to, uh, to pursue that as far as I can, so I guess that's what led to me, you know, being a scientist. You know, what, what kind of academic kind of progression did this take? What what university did you start out at? Um, I, so I did my degree and uh, eventually my PhD at uh, University of Glasgow. So I did a degree in um, uh, mathematics and physics at University of Glasgow. And then I applied for and got a scholarship to stay on to do a PhD in um, uh, originally, it was meant to be in plasma physics, but it got uh, rapidly um, derailed into magnetohydrodynamics and um, uh, algorithmic um, uh, genetic algorithms, uh, genetic algorithmic solution of uh, Poisson's equation. So, so that was my story with um, on the. Uh, academic side. I actually started off wanting to do chemistry and I got to university and uh, decided that chemistry wasn't for me but I liked I liked the uh, I liked physics and mathematics more so I was able to switch. So that's that's the story. Excellent, yeah. Um, we're very glad that you switched then. Following on from that, you went on to do a postdoc at St. Andrews. That's right, yeah. I did uh, my first postdoc after my uh, PhD was a position in uh, St. Andrews with the the solar group in uh, the School of Mathematical Sciences, um, just right next to the physics building. And so I came over for an interview and um, uh, Professor uh, Eric Priest was not there that day, but I was interviewed by uh, Professor Hood, 
and uh, that went well and I was um, fortunate enough to be uh, uh, offered a, a postdoc position and with the eventual uh, the goal of the position was to start doing some data analysis with the uh, SOHO spacecraft which was uh, scheduled to be to be launched in, in the near future so uh, that was the that was the job that was offered and I, I took it so I up sticks from the west coast and went off to the east nuke so that's how I ended up in St Andrews not the furthest travel uh, distance that you would travel though for your research no uh, no that's true but the uh, that is that is definitely true but um the uh, the group at St Andrews was expanding rapidly at the time, and it, ha <clears throat> it had and it still has a very high international reputation. So it's you know it was not like in terms of like um, a career move. Then it was not um, you're right. You know it wasn't exotic in terms of like go to some fancy country somewhere that you've never been to, but the group itself is very strong, and so uh, it's <clears throat> it was attractive from that point of view. And would you say that solar physics is one of the areas um, in particular that has a really strong crossover between maths and physics? Um, absolutely. So um, uh, solar physics is, a, for the most part, is a, a remote sensing discipline, and so when you get the when you get the data. Then you know you don't have an experiment in the lab that you can play with. Um, so once you get the data, then uh, everything's numeric uh, after that. So uh, programming skills and mathematical skills and uh, uh, theory are uh, all very strong. You know you definitely need uh, all of those um, skills to be able to to go forward. Excellent. Yeah. And now, obviously, you're working at NASA. So could you tell us maybe a bit about how you see research culture varying between the US and the UK? Well, so I left the, uh, the UK. Um, I can't speak for the, uh, the, the recent experience of uh, researchers in the UK, but I can sort of make some general points about, the, um, about my experience at NASA and the um, experience at, um, at St Andrews. Um, there's a lot of similarities actually. So, I mean, you are talking to colleagues, uh, getting the latest um, information about various spacecraft and you know who's doing what, when, it's, you know, Basically the same on a like a on a personal level. There's no uh, there's no difference really. So um, there's science goals that everyone needs to that everyone's working towards. So there's there's no change there. Um, so working at NASA, working at NASA and in the uh, United States, um, you are very much. Um, made aware that the, like a lot of the funding comes um, from uh, federal government sources. And so it's important to follow what the uh, uh, federal government decides is, is important. And that's a two-way process because the community also tells NASA and the NSF, those, those organizations actually solicit um, ideas and so there's there's a back and forth between the community and the, the funding organizations and I'm sure the same thing goes on uh, at the in, in the UK like I'm, I'm pretty sure that that would be the same um, but it is interesting to sort of see the like you get to participate a little bit more in like, you know, when you're designing a mission or something like that, or trying to decide on, on science goals for um, like the next 10, 15 years, then 
that is something that the agencies, the uh, National Science Foundation and, and NASA really do uh, solicit from the community. Um, no, it's kind of interesting sort of being at NASA because you do get to see like some of the like it's not just pure science. There's the there's also the the idea of like of how the community uh, uh, de um, should develop. So that's definitely part of the of the goals of of NASA and the NSF is to make foster the community and make sure that there's you know, research going forward. So. So on a personal level, it's much the same, but maybe in a more organizational sense, you see more progress being made towards goals that have been set far in the future, that kind of thing? So yeah. on the, I would say like on a personal level, then, you know, your interaction with, with your colleagues is, is more or less the same um, uh, in the UK and the US. That, that doesn't change. I mean, like everyone's just people, right? And so, um, but uh, I mean, the organisational culture obviously makes a big difference, and uh, like I said at the top, like I don't, I'm not so familiar with uh, how um, UK science uh, organisation uh, goes on. So, um, I mean, there's definitely input from like so when when you're designing like a, it's been it's been my experience when I've seen the emissions being uh, uh, designed and science goals being hammered out, then it that it is an international affair. It's not just the United States mm -hmm. that that decides yeah, everything. Definitely. So there's people from from all over the world um, uh, participate. The funding agencies are, are one thing, but like the people who are providing the ideas, they're, they're from everywhere. Excellent. Yeah. Is there maybe something that people don't generally appreciate about your area of research, heliophysics or physics in general even? Uh, it's been my uh, experience seeing um, missions being designed and uh, science goals being hammered out. Uh, there's a real to and fro between the uh, community and uh, the US uh, domestic funding agencies. Um, and uh, you know a lot of things have to be taken into account, like um, uh, national uh, U.S. national priorities, um, uh, possible interaction with other domestic and uh, international agencies, and uh, science goals, current science goals, and future science goals. And um, it's really quite an interesting process. Is there a concept of physics that you struggled with when you were a student? Um, yes. And it was quantum mechanics was the, uh, that was the big struggle. So at, at Glasgow, um, the everyone told us that, um, oh yeah, first two years, that's, that's easy. Um, but the third year, that's when you know things really kick in, and so the idea of of uh, quantum mechanics was a real struggle for. Um, I remember it being a real struggle for for me and the rest of the class, because you know we used to ask, we were like, "Where does Schrödinger's equation come from?" And there wasn't really a good answer for that. It was just like somebody just made it up, and, <laughs> and then that that was it, and, and so. And then the whole, like, in the quantum world is just, you know, it's just fundamentally weird. We have no direct experience of it, or very little direct experience of it. So those concepts were, were a, real, a real struggle for me. Yeah, definitely a difficult one to grasp. Could you maybe explain, a little bit of a challenge here, explain the concept of nuclear fusion within stars within a minute? Is that a challenge you can take on? Well, is that a challenge I can take on? Well, it's pretty, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy, but um, uh, let me see. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> we'll start in five. 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 <laughs> Four, three, two, one. Time starts now. Okay. So 
you have, probably everyone's more familiar with nuclear fission is when you split an atom then you get you know uh, smaller bits of the atom and then some of the uh, you find out that there's an there's a mass difference between the small bits and what you started off with and the difference uh, is the energy that's released well fusion is, is like you take the some atoms and smash them smash them and then smash them together and then they form a completely different but bigger atom instead of in fission when you get smaller atoms fusion you get uh, more massive um, atoms but again the energy the mass that you started off with is uh, more than the mass you end up with and the difference turns into energy five four three two one Hey, you're finished. Yeah, it was like five, se it. five seconds to spare. Oh, you had tons of time. You should have went for another, another subject. How often do you work studying stars outside of our solar system? How often do I work on studying stars outside the solar system? Mm -hmm. In my job? Yeah. Um, no time at all. I <laughs> don't... <laughs> so I'd, I'd, Actually, that's not quite true. So um, we do have uh, some ideas about, um, and we have a, a small group that's just getting started to look at um, uh, flares on other, uh, well, you know, you have solar flares, which are large en energy release events on the, on the sun. Well, you get those in other stars as well. And... Um, We've just started up a small group to uh, between the solar physics group at NASA and uh, the the Kepler uh, experts who have you know amazing time series of of flares on uh, other stars, and so we're just beginning that collaboration. So that is something actually that's I would put that more in the future work category, and in fact I'm going up to. Uh, New York University in a couple of weeks to to kick that off with some um, some uh, collaborators up there along with the ones down at um, NASA Goddard. So. Sounds interesting, then something to look look out for in the future. Well, you know, if you think about like all the like if you've seen the Hertzsprung Russell diagram of uh, stars, then like the sun is just one point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can draw any line you like through one point, right? So if we begin to study, you know, studying other stars will definitely help us un understand um, our closest star. Yeah. Um, who or what was your biggest influence during your student years? I mean, I I, I truly had wonderful support from uh, my family. That is a like I can't. Uh, emphasize that enough to be honest like my uh, I remember uh, uh, going to finals uh, on the train and my dad was going in on the on the train at the same time and so the two of us would uh, would just like I had to study before going into the finals so I uh, I remember like you know I was super nervous, and so it was. It was good to have my dad there, and he would just sort of leave me alone. And you know, like we did that for two weeks or something, or two or three weeks during the the whole duration of the of the of the finals. So even that kind of like simple sort of just just being there that's that was uh, important to to get through the uh, to get through your finals because you know, it's a big deal. Um, yeah, that's lovely to hear. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it was it was lovely that he did that. So, and the, you know, the rest of my family was uh, obviously uh, quite supportive. Um, uh, academically, I mean, there are just some teachers which are more. Uh, like I remember a, a couple of teachers in mathematics who were really um, had completely different uh, views on on how to how to teach. There was one guy uh, in uh, applied mechanics who would just, he said, these lectures are going to be 40 minutes long and I'm going to stop for five minutes after 20 minutes. 
And that's exactly what he did. So like all the lectures were 40 minutes long. There was only 35 minutes of content. And there was only, you know, he would just stop and ask questions and everyone would take a break and and start up again. And so that kind of level of, of care of like, you know, this is kind of, you know, uh, I know this is hard, so I knew, like, you know, research shows that you can't really concentrate for too long, so, like, we're going to take advantage of that and you know, um, get you out of here as quickly as possible. So that was great. So, I mean, that, that guy, uh, Professor Strawn was his name. He was a wonderful teacher. So are there any lasting impressions that St. Andrews has made on your subsequent career in astrophysics? Well, I've remained a solar physicist, so... That's a good start. <laughs> that's one, one aspect. Um, so, my time at St Andrews gave me a lot of uh, different experience. So, uh, the principal one is that um, I was fortunate enough to join the, the SOHO project. Professor Priest had some uh, research funding to do data analysis with the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. So uh, I was able to um, travel over to NASA Goddard to um, my uh, first visit because of uh, th that uh, opportunity that I had from uh, St Andrews. So, so that's a big deal. And uh, so yeah, also my like my postdoc experience there sort of went from um, yeah, it gave me like you know I did some theoretical uh, MHD, I did a small amount of um, numerical work, uh, data analysis, and even got into kind of uh, instrument operations. So like I had a, a really broad. Um, exposure to a lot of things that um, a research career can give you so I guess that's the I guess that's the lasting impression that I got Excellent, yeah um, What opportunities have you had to go view solar eclipses because obviously Northern America is having one this summer and so, Well um, the last one that was over the UK was in 1999, and I was already I was doing a, a instrument operations for the coronal diagnostic spectrometer on that day at uh, at NASA Goddard, so I missed that one. Um, I've only seen one total solar eclipse, and that was in China in 2009, and it was uh, spectacular. It was um, over. It's about four and a half minutes of um, totality, and it was just like, for my money, it's the most spectacular thing in the sky. Everyone should see one. It's just amazing. It gives you a real sense of like um, orbital dynamics and the universe and all that stuff. Like orbits and planets are all kind of. Um, abstract until you're in the shadow of, of another celestial body and then you realize just like oh yeah this stuff is real <laughs> so. what do you consider the most exciting project that you've worked on at nasa the most exciting project that i've worked on at nasa have been the ones that i started and which ones were they uh well, so I have a, um, I'm part of a project called the HelioViewer project, which is a, a solar data visualization uh, project, um, which uh, allows uh, anyone to um, look at the very latest data from the sun and find out what's going on for themselves. So that started off as the, the core of that started off uh, back in 2005 and you know more people uh, have joined the project and other parts have have come on to the project and we've been supported by the European Space Agency and, and NASA 
and uh, we've had tremendous success with that. So that's a kind of um, uh, one that I'm sort of uh, I'm very excited about. But yeah, the, uh, the other one was uh, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which was um, a multi instrument, multinational effort to try and understand um, uh, the sun. And the exciting thing about that was that like, we had people from all over the world turning up at NASA to collaborate and, and work on these uh, difficult solar problems. So it was like, it was an incredibly exciting time because, you know, the data at the time was the best that we'd ever had. There were people coming in from all over the world. You'd meet new people and you'd discuss new things. And um, it was just an incredible uh, atmosphere of, you know, a lot of discovery and a lot of finding out, you know, about lots of different people. It was just really, really wonderful. Yeah, so, uh, you know, something you've worked on and then this very exciting scientific collaboration. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And um, HelioViewer, you know, you have said it's accessible to the public and it's very user-friendly. So is there something important that you think about equipping the public and as many people as possible with the tools to do science? Well, um, this is another uh, aspect that, yes, I think, it's very important that um, we give back the the best of what we can from, the, from what the public has paid us to do, right? So, like, even though I work for a contracting company, that uh, money uh, comes from um, the taxpayer, the U.S. taxpayer. So it's incredibly important that uh, people are able to... Um, uh, reap the benefits of of uh, our efforts and uh, what they've decided or their representatives have decided to to spend their money on. So I think it's incredibly important that um, you know we make uh, strong efforts to explain our signs and um, let people enjoy what we are looking at. And certainly the the response that we've had from uh, Helio Viewer has is a testament to that. There's so many people use it, they can't all be solar physicists, so we know that <laughs> there's lots of members of the public that are, are uh, using it, and it's, it's gratifying. No, it's always good to see like that um, interaction with the public and science. Yes. HelioViewer and your other projects, they require a lot of data analysis and programming. Are these skills that you've picked up with time or with formal training? Uh, unfortunately, all my uh, programming skills uh, were picked up uh, informally, and to be a, a scientist nowadays, uh, I think you really need uh, programming skills, at least to do the type of science that, that I do. There's a lot of data analysis and um, small amounts of uh, statistics and, uh, and theory. So... Um, Yes, you need uh, programming, but all my uh, programming experience was just um, self-taught, so and badly at that. But you've made it work, uh, which is the important thing. Well, obviously. yes, in my scientific research career, but like I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough to program something like. Uh, the Helio Viewer project, so that's why having a, a big collaboration <laughs> is is a great idea because you know get the experts in to um, to do it because mm -hmm. they'll do it better than you can and they'll do it faster than you can. So I'm not I'm not one for like, well it's just easier to um, to have the the people who know what they're doing do what they know. We're going to tail off there for this half of our interview with Dr. Jack Ireland. Tune into the second half to find out what Dr. Ireland has to say on the differences between American and Scottish lifestyles, what music NASA researchers listen to, and hear him settle which is more scenic, America or Scotland. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Lavery. 
Thanks to all the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our publicity officer, Connor McBride. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrews Physics Society for our website. Goodbye.